Welcome to Rethink, the podcast that empowers you to challenge your existing beliefs and embrace new, more productive ways of thinking. Here at Rethink, we believe that the key to self-fulfillment lies in shattering old thought patterns and adopting new mindsets that support personal growth and empowerment. With expert guests and thought leaders from a wide range of fields, we explore strategies and insights that can help you achieve success and fulfillment in all areas of your life. From relationships to career, business ownership, and health, you are the source of your own success. We're just here to help you tap into your true potential and create a brighter future. So join us on the journey of personal growth and empowerment, and let's rethink what's possible for our lives. How do search engines actually work? Today, we're going to be taking a look at Google. Stick around. Things You Should Know podcast, our focus varies from commonly asked questions like, what are the top email apps for iPhone users, or how much does it cost to go to Disney World anyway, to the trending topics of the day such as, are taxes going up or down, and who's Elon Musk? We shed light on things you probably have always wondered about, but you never got around to investigating them yourself. This podcast brings you the answers to your most commonly asked questions and makes you smarter just by listening. Information empowers, and the more information you have, the better decision you can make, and ultimately, your quality of life is based on the decisions you make. So, thanks for joining the discussion, and make sure that you subscribe today and not miss out on any future episodes of Things You Should Know. Hey guys, welcome to the show. We have reached the You Should Know podcast, and I'm your host, Kelly. So it's my pleasure to welcome you into the podcast. Hope you guys are off to a fantastic uh, day, a fantastic week, fantastic month, all that good stuff. It's uh, always my pleasure to welcome you into this space, this safe space where we can share ideas and learn and empower each other through information that hopefully heretofore you did not know. Today, as you heard in the uh, intro, uh, we're going to be talking about search engines and specifically Google. How does it work? How does it really work when you go to query, find out uh, information? Most people just Google stuff It's actually become a term. Did you Google that? I'd Google that if I was you, et cetera. So we're going to be digging into uh, uh, some technical information today and figure out how search engines actually work. So stick around for that. Uh, Before we get going, as always, first timers, thank you for finding us and uh, go ahead now and subscribe to the podcast before you forget where we are. Things you should know. We really appreciate it. Long timers, folks who have been supporting the podcast since day one. And you guys keep coming back week in and week out to support uh, this podcast. And we certainly do appreciate it. Right now, uh, we have an opportunity uh, for subscription services to get additional content from the podcast that I like to point you in that direction. All you have to do is go to the show notes. We partner with a group called Supercast and it uh, allows you to um, uh, obtain a paid subscription to this podcast. And that way uh, you can help us uh, as we grow. You can help us as we uh, do what we do in the community. And uh, a lot of information is laid out there on our uh, members page. So take a look at those plans and see if any of those interest you. I'm super excited about it. Um, And we'll talk a little bit more about it at the end of the podcast and give you some more specifics. But take a look at that today. If you're interested in supporting financially the podcast, just go right down to the show notes. Click on that top link that you see. It says subscribers link, and that will take you straight to the subscribers page. A lot of great information there. And the good thing is you don't even have to come out of your browser. 
If you're on your mobile device, which most people are, it'll simply take you there while you're listening and you can go and read and subscribe and get additional content from things you should know. All right, guys, so let's get going because it actually is a lot of information uh, that I have to share with you today as we go over this topic again. Uh, we're talking about, from a scientific standpoint, how do search engines work? How does the Internet search engines actually work? As we do here, I've got about three articles. Well, actually, I have exactly three articles that I'm going to be posting over on our Facebook page for you to review at your leisure. And it goes into greater detail. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I wanted to make sure that you had access to the information as we normally do. In the event that you want to vet what I'm saying, which I hope you will do to make sure that it is correct. So when I was thinking about this, this is one of those things that you just say, you know what? This is a large question. Uh, do I have even the um, technical prowess, the mental stamina <laughs> to even approach this question and try to understand uh, how something that seems very complex works? So we're going to approach it today step by step. We're going to start off with science, of course. Uh, there's an article that comes to us from scientificamerican.com. And there is a professor. His name is, uh, let me see if I can, uh, uh, Javed or Javid Mustafa. He is associate professor of information science and director of laboratory over at Applied Information at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. And so he wrote this article and it goes into detail, not just about Google, but conceptually, how do search engines work? What's happening when we're searching for information? OK, so there's a process, as you would guess, there's a process to all of this. So let's see if we can uh, dig in here and try to understand what that process is. So let's first of all, talk about the scope of uh, information that we're talking about. So if you're talking about the internet and if you want to think about it, uh, I don't know, uh, from a library standpoint, because that would be, um, sort of the best qualifier because in my day when I was a kid, we didn't have, you know, access to the internet. So we had encyclopedias and we had access to libraries, public libraries, libraries at your school, and when I was in college, even the primary source of gathering information, although, you know, we did have some access to uh, online, it was still mostly research facilities and the library. You know, we, we had access to the library and I don't know if kids still go to the library these days. I would assume they do. Uh, I would assume they do. I don't know. But you've got uh, the equivalent uh, in terms of informational search engines 40 times 40 times the amount of information uh, that's digitized content of, let's say, the Library of Congress. And Library of Congress has a lot of information. It's the world's largest library. But on the Internet, you have 40 times that amount of information. And the reason I bring that up is because if I ask you to, let's say, if I ask you to wash dishes and I, you had 10 dishes to wash, or if you had five or six shifts of restaurant changing in and out, uh, you had several sinks to wash. There'd be two very different things. So the expectation would be that you would finish at different times or you would not, you know, have uh, this task completed uh, in a quick, quicker fashion. Uh, maybe that's not the best example, but uh, there's a lot of information on the Internet is my point. So that's the base for where we start, because now you've got to talk about uh, where is this information? How do we house it? Where do we keep it secure? How do we provide it to the end user? How do we decipher their questions when they ask? So we give them the right information, right? I'm riding around today and I'm in my car and I'm blue uh, is a very different uh, sentence or a very different expression than my car is blue as I'm riding around today. So when you go in to access information, the search engine has to decipher what it is that you're asking for. So let's get into it. 
Stay with us. We'll be right back. Here's an offer we thought you'd be interested in. Are you looking to develop and create stunning coursework? Uh, launch your stunning academy website in a snap. You can choose from among 50 plus designer made, ready to go, industry specific site templates to launch your website fast and with confidence. It's very simple, very powerful. They're flexible courses. You can wave goodbye to dull educational content. There are countless ways to package and distribute your learning content. Create listed or private courses that can be paid or free courses, or you can drip feed your content to build and to nurture your audience the way that you want. You can create compelling and interactive courses, leverage the most rich library of learning activities, and undoubtedly the most customizable course player in the market to build flexible learning experiences to keep your listeners engaged. And lastly, be the boss of your content and design your final course product exactly as you envision it. Preview it as you build it in real time. Get it up and running fast than you ever have imagined. Why don't you go down the show notes, guys, today and uh, click on Learns World. If you're interested in building courses that matter, you can monetize, create memberships, create courses, and create passive income for yourself. So support our sponsor, Learns World. So there are a multitude of information providers on the web. You, you may know, you may not, but there are more search engines than Google. Although we primarily use Google, there, there are others out there, Yahoo and Bing and things like that. Um, some are commonly known and some are not commonly known. Some are public and some are not public. So a public source of information or a web provider or information provider on the web, rather, is a company like Google or InfoSeek, or Northern Light. A second group of sources, these are referred to as the hidden web. It's a much larger uh, group than the public web in terms of the amount of information that they provide. Uh, this latter group includes sources uh, such as Dialog, Ignita, and LexisNexis. Now, they remain hidden for a various reasons. Number one, they may not allow other uh, information providers to actually access their content. Number two, they may require a subscription in order to access their content. Or number three, they may demand payment for access. So what we're going to go through here is. Um, it's going to be concerned with the former group. You know, Google, uh, Bing, Yahoo, web search, things that are made public. How is that information prepared? Uh, search engines employ various techniques, as you would imagine, to speed up searches because of the amount of information that's actually out there and what it has to weed through in order to go through all that information to bring back to you the actual uh, information that you're requesting. So here are some of the more common techniques uh, that search engines use in order to qualify information. Number one is pre-processed data, pre-processed data. So one way search engines save time is by pre-processing the content on the web. That's to say when a user issues a query, it's not actually sent to millions of different websites to investigate those websites. Instead, the matching takes place against pre-processed data stored on one particular site. The pre-processing is carried out with the aid of a software program, and you've probably heard of this in some way, shape, form, or fashion. It's called a crawler, C-R-A-W-L-E-R, -E a crawler. And the crawler is sent out periodically by the database uh, maintenance group to collect web pages. So let's say you uh, have a new business and you start off with a new website and people are talking to you about SEO, search engine optimization. And possibly one of the parts of that conversation would be you want to insert certain keywords. You want to be very descriptive because when people are looking for your services or your product, when the search engine crawls your website, 
it will obtain this information and it can log it. And that's really what makes the search engine optimization work. Periodically, the search engines go through your information on your website and it's called crawling and it will gather important data, uh, particularly keywords, and it will log them. So when there's a user and end user searching for maybe a service or a product that you offer, perhaps independent, there's a lot of the qualifiers too, but your uh, website may come up in the, uh, in the end results. Now, a specialized computer program parses the retrieved pages to extract words in the crawler. These words are then stored along with the links to the corresponding pages, and then it creates what's called an index file. So the queries actually match up against the index file, not against other websites. OK, so you have a crawler crawler gets and extracts words. The words are indexed and then the queries match up against the index. OK, now the second way that um, or the second technique, I should say, is called smart representation. And in this technique, the representation for the index is carefully selected with an eye towards minimizing the search time. In other words, you don't want to be waiting all day for you know, uh, what time is it in Las Vegas or what's the weather in Los Angeles? Information scientists have produced an efficient data structure called a tree that can guarantee significantly shorter overall search time compared with searches conducted against a SQL list. Uh, to accommodate searches conducted by many users simultaneously and eliminate wait queues. The index is usually duplicated on multiple computers in the search site. Okay. So that's number two. Number three is prioritizing results. Uh, you are aware of URLs and links uh, in this technique to provide quicker access to the most relevant records. The search algorithm applies various ranking strategies. A common ranking strategy or method known as term frequency inverse document frequency TFIDF it considers the distribution of words and their frequencies and generates numerical weights for words signifying their importance in individual documents okay so I want you to I'm kind of slowing down because this is really technical but a common ranking method is known as TFIDF, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. It considers the distribution of words and their frequencies. And then it generates a numerical value or a weight for those words, whereby maybe they occur on a high, uh, you know, uh, frequency a high number of times and it what it does it signifies their value their level of importance based on an individual document so let's look at this it produces word weights whereby words that are highly frequent such as am or to or be or with and they may appear many times in a document they have substantially less weight than words that are uh, semantically more relevant and they uh, appear relatively fewer times so let's say uh, outside of those verbs that we were just talking about, but let's say uh, if you're looking for Carvette, you know, Carvette and Carvette probably is not going to come up a lot of times in any document because this is not a word that you would you would use. So the significance in terms of the value would be different, would be different. I'm sorry. Now, in addition to term weighting, Web pages can be weighed using other strategies. So here's an example. Link analysis considers the nature of each page in terms of association with other pages, namely if it is an authority or a hub. The highly successful Google search engine uses what's called link analysis to improve the ranking of its search results. And we're going to get into specifics on how Google works in just a minute. But that is very true. That is very true. Uh, many of you know that Google is the largest uh, search engine. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. 
But maybe you didn't know that uh, Google accounts for uh, 76% of global internet searches compared to any other search engine, 76%. Now, if I had to bet, if I had to ask you, okay, outside of Google, can you name at least three other search engines? I wonder how many people could. I would struggle, quite honestly. Uh, when I first started using the internet, Google wasn't a thing. It was Netscape. It was Yahoo. It was AOL. It was, um, oh my goodness, what was the other one? Uh, internet Explorer, things like that. And a lot of that has uh, left us. You know, some of them have stayed, but Google pretty much is to is to prefer. And we're going to talk about why. Now, there are two other techniques. One is called um, context and distance. So in order to identify the most relevant links quickly, certain search engines compare query terms to contextual information, such as recent queries from other users. This technique, sometimes referred to as query catching, involves collecting words from recent queries and using them to disambugate or refine or even expand the query. Another way certain information providers can speed up the delivery of search information and results is by using a distributed delivery model whereby copies of the index and related contexts are duplicated and moved to multiple geographical locations so as to shorten the network distance between user and context. So it sounds like moving the server or having servers located in different areas of the world. And the last is called limitations. The last is called limitations. Um, so let's jump over to um, our second article. We're going to be looking and, and just talking about the global dominance of Google. And this article comes to us from firstsiteguide.com. It says Google search statistics and facts, things you must know for 2021. And you're going to find out a lot about Google. First of all, I didn't realize, but yes, Google has 76% of the global Internet searches compared to other search engines. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, Google has over one billion uh, people who've used either its product or services, chances are you've done it as well. You've Googled something, you use Gmail, perhaps one of my uh, best personal email accounts is Gmail. There's a lot of functionality there. There are a lot of uh, end user uh, products available, lists, a number of things that you could do to make your life easier. Now, in order to comprehend the sheer size of Google, uh, we need to understand the extent of the Internet as a whole, which is what I was trying to get you to understand at the beginning. The size of the Internet, when I said 40 times uh, the size of what's digitized uh, in the Library of Congress, uh, Google is an indexing and searching service which provides us with connections to websites and pages based on specific search queries. So that's really a great that's a great definition for what is Google? So Google is an indexing and search uh, engine uh, searching service, which provides us, the end user, with connections to websites and pages based on specific search queries. So basically, whatever you type in, uh, you know, uh, Thai food close to me or where is the closest Home Depot? Uh, what time does Walmart close? Um, how do I get to? Uh, the festival downtown, whatever the case may be. These are our queries. Um, all right, so let's jump over here. Interesting Google search statistics. So let's look and see in terms of the scope. There are more than 3.5 billion Google searches conducted every day. 3.5 billion searches conducted every single day. I've already told you Google has 70 percent of all global searches. They take place on Google. Uh, the Google search index contains more than 100 million gigabytes, 100 million. 16 to 20 percent of all annual Google search results are actually new. 
They're new searches. They're not something that's been queried before. And more than 60% of Google searches come from mobile devices. Now that makes a lot of sense um, because, you know, Google has other products and services. You can include Google Maps, which when I travel, uh, I don't care if it's GPS or whether if I'm in a city, for example, recently I was in Chicago and I don't really know Chicago in terms of its uh, geography. So I would use Google Maps to get from point to point. You can use features such as walking or driving or using the transit there. Google can has index and they have answers to all of those queries and they can lead you via GPS where you need to go. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Google. Number one, the top search engines uh, within the market share worldwide. Let's talk about who those folks are. Google dominates that field, by the way, at more than 90% market position, 90%. The second, the second most popular search engine, who would you think that is? I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think. Who would you think the second most popular search engine besides Google would be? Now, for those of us who can only name like Yahoo or Bing, it's going to be one of those, right? All right, time's up. So the second most popular search engine in the market is Bing, and they have a whopping 2.78%. And of course, anyone after Bing has a smaller portion. So Google owns the market over 90%. Uh, Google search queries from 1999 to 2019, the growth rate of global Internet users each year is about 8.2 percent. Google searches completed per year grew around 10 percent per year between 2009 to 2012. And based on those numbers, a historical graph shows and I'm going to put this on our Facebook page, the growth, the trend which is tremendous from 2000, I'm sorry, from 1999 to 2012, which uh, estimates that Google search queries grew per year by roughly 10%. So think about that cumulatively 10% each year, but over uh, the span of about 10 or 11 years, it's a lot of growth. Uh, Number three, there are 40,000 Google searches every second. Now, a second goes by that Google doesn't have about 40,000 search queries to process. That's a lot of stuff to process. And this means that globally, Google Google processes more than 3.5. This would make up the 3.5 million, 3.5 million searches number. Google processes more than 3.5 million searches every day and 1.2 trillion searches every year. So there are a lot of people using Google. Number four. Google's annual revenue growth from 2002 to 2019. So let's see, uh, it's grown to such an extent that the advertising revenue reached, this is past millions, this is billions. So it's 95 billion in 2017. (laughs) Stay with us. We'll be right back. Here's a podcast we thought you'd like. Hi, it's Tahimia. It's Cam. Rachel. And Amani, your hostesses at The Art of Making It Work, the podcast that knows life doesn't need any help being hard, but sometimes we need a little help making it easier. On our show, we discuss an array of topics ranging from travel to friendships and even finances with a whole lot of girl chat in between. We're here to give you research-based life hacks and initiate discussions to help you and one another navigate this thing called life. So tune in to The Art of Making It Work every Monday for new episodes wherever you stream your podcast content. Ninety five billion. This was in 2017. So I wonder what it is today. One hundred and sixty point seven four primarily. Yeah, one hundred and sixty billion. So Google's annual revenue right now. And this was done in 2019, actually one hundred thirty four. Then they say now it's one hundred and sixty This articles a little confusing. But 2019, they had the number listed at 160.74 billion. 
That's a lot. All right, so let's go to number five, top 10 global Google searches in 2019. Uh, <laughs> number one was India versus South Africa. I guess that was uh, soccer or football to the wider world beyond the United States. Number two was Cameron Boyce, who I don't even know who that is. Copa America is number three. Bangladesh versus India was number four. And number five, the iPhone, iPhone 11. Number six was Game of Thrones. Number seven is Avengers Endgame. Number eight was the movie The Joker. And then number nine was Notre Dame. And number 10 was ICC Cricket World Cup. These topics obviously are... Um, you know, depending on what's going on during that time. So this is not a topic. Obviously, India, India versus South Africa wouldn't be a top search uh, today, July the 6th, 2021. Uh, but the thing that I do like about Google is you can use they have tools and products to help their end user. If you're looking to advertise on Google's platform and it's called Google Trends or Google Keywords, where you can go in and you can access this information it houses and archives all of this historical data so that you know what people are searching for and different from let's say Facebook ads and YouTube ads and things like that. When people go to Google and type in uh, where can I find a white dress or uh, white dress, you know, some sort of information about a white dress, chances are they're looking to purchase a white dress. So if you are an e-commerce person and you sell dresses and you happen to have white dresses, uh, that's a great way, obviously, to get a uh, new clientele. So that's Google Trends and Google Ads, Google Keywords. All right. So number six, 92.26 percent of all global searches take place on Google. So we talked about that before. Number seven, top five domains with the most visit. This is some more information that you can get. Uh, through Google, but the top five domains are in this order, Google, which is 74.17 billion visits so far. Then who would you think is next? You're right. It's YouTube, but less than half. Uh, YouTube is showing 27.36. Facebook is showing 21. Uh, Twitter is all the way down at four, all the way down at four. But Google not only can assist you with your queries from day to day, but there's some very good index uh, uh, search engine information available for advertisers and for e-commerce folks and just business people. Uh, period. If you have a brick and mortar, uh, you sell um, office chairs. This is a great way to find your audience and let them know where your store is and the fact that you sell office chairs. OK. All right, so kind of closing this out, we want to hear from the president of Google in terms of where Google is and kind of what his vision is in terms of uh, uh, the company. Um, Google search engine is, as we said, a very powerful tool, but the Internet is a big place and it's always growing. It's sometimes hard to find what you're looking for, particularly if you don't know uh, how to spell something or the correct pronunciation for something. Uh, sometimes it's hard, but we expect for Google to be able to kind of dig in there, sort of like our spell check and figure out what it is that we meant to say and what it is that we meant by these terms. I don't know about you, but I have a Google Home. Um, uh, what do you call it? A Google Home device. And sometimes I won't ask the question the correct way. And it depends on how I ask the question as to how I get the answer. And so you have to be cognizant of that when you're searching for things. Uh, but many times if you misspell a word, uh, if you're off in terms of subject verb agreement, it doesn't really matter. Google somehow figures out what it is you're trying to ask. And I think it's because of previous queries. You may go in to put that information and it'll say right below, say, did you mean? And then it'll type it out correctly. And then of course you click on that and you'll go to your search results. So Google's very, very powerful. It's very, very slick in terms of being able to discern the end user's uh, ultimate desire. So the president says uh, throughout the company, uh, you know, nobody really just comes to him and say, hey, everything's working perfectly. You know, the searches are great. Everything is fine because it's not the case. They're always in what's called uh, industry term uh, continuous improvement. 
So for them, they say it's a deep, deep responsibility to give the end users great results, great answers, great experiences, and help them uh, to go about their lives more effectively. Uh, because you think about the questions that are being asked sometimes, uh, many times people are Googling places to go eat or to go shop, to get cheap gas. Uh, where do I find, you know, a particular thing to purchase? It could be grocery store. It could be, um, you know, things that really impact their day to day lives and they need the answer and they would like to have it quickly because we already talked about more than 70 percent of those Queries come through a mobile device, which tells me the person is mobile. You know, if you're headed to a concert or to a friend's house or, you know, you're out of town and you need to stop at the closest store, you need to know where that store is or you need to know where that friend's house is or you need to understand what time does that business close or open or whatever the case may be because you're in transit. Um, so that's kind of it with... Uh, with, with Google. Google uh, dominates the industry. Next time you go to Google, maybe some of this information will come to mind and you'll have the appreciation for how fast you're actually getting back this information and how accurate it is. I think we get complacent a lot of times uh, with cell phones, with the internet, with even, you know, uh, on-demand TV, things like that, when there's buffering or you know, maybe something doesn't happen as quickly as you like to understand the scope of what you're asking this technology to do and what it's capable of doing is absolutely mind blowing. And so hopefully this podcast has given you some level of appreciation for that. Some of the things that Google can help you with, in case you didn't know, images, which I use Google for all the time. You know, if when I'm doing like some sort of marketing paraphernalia or illustration and I need an image, a translucent background or s something uh, and I can't find it on Canva, I'm going straight to Google. All you have to do is type in what you're looking for and the images pop up. I love the fact that it, that it does that. Uh, it can help you with maps. Of course, I already talked about that, the maps piece. Uh, news articles or video footage. Of course, Google and YouTube are you know, one in the same. So Google uh, indexes a lot of YouTube videos and they're able to prioritize and classify them based on your search query and provide you with written documents, which are the news article, but also video footage of what you may be uh, querying as well. Google can provide you with products or services to purchase online. Hey, I need a bag for my drone. Oh, what's your drone number? Uh, Holy Stone 700D, uh, you know, travel bag. And bam, it pops right up. It, it You can click on it. It takes you straight to that provider, whether it's Amazon or eBay or Google Marketplace, wherever. And it makes the experience for the end user so easy and so seamless. Google also provides content in books, uh, videos, as we already talked about, and scholarly papers. One of the uh, things that I really love about Google is the planet earth feature or the Google earth uh, deal. Just imagine you sitting in a classroom of uh, elementary school kids or middle school kids, uh, or even high school kids, but kids who haven't traveled or really seen the world. We didn't have this technology when I was in grade school, but you're able to actually uh, type in a location. Let's call it Disney world. And you can literally go there through your, you know, internet provider through your connectivity and um, you can see and uh, the, the, the attractions, you can see the castle, you can see everything that you normally would see uh, if you were there, except it is on your computer screen. And for people who live in, uh, you know, far away from locations like that or may never get a chance to travel there, it's a wonderful way to to be able to see the earth, to see the world and not have to leave the comfort of your, of your own home. And maybe it'll even uh, increase the amount of interest in people wanting to go different places. You know, maybe there's a place you've heard of. Maybe you've heard of the Blue Lagoon in Jamaica. And you've never been there. You want to know what it looks like. Well, all you have to do is go to Google Earth and Google it. And you can literally go there virtually and, and take a look at it and decide there's some place that you would want to go. Uh, at some point in your life. 
But guys, that's it. I'm going to put all of this information on our Facebook page. I hope you have learned something today. I tried to stay on topic and, and get into as much detail in some of these articles as I could without being too technical because I know if you're not technical some of this can sound like mumbo jumbo and I'm kind of the same but I think at the end of the day we've used this product so much this search engine so much that we're well aware of what Google is we just now know how it works so thanks again for joining me today at things you should know we'll be back in two days with more great content if you've not done so already, go ahead and subscribe and hang around on the back end. We're going to tell you a little bit more about our subscription services. I hope you guys have a great day and we'll be talking to you soon. That's all for today's episode of Rethink. We hope that you've enjoyed this exploration of new ideas and perspectives and found valuable insights and strategies that you can apply to your life. Remember, you are the source of your own success and fulfillment. And by embracing new ways of thinking, you can unlock your true potential and yes, create the life that you truly desire. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to support the podcast by sharing it with your friends, your family members, your loved ones and associates, and even your followers on social media. Also, leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Lastly, don't forget to check out our show notes for free downloads and empowering ebooks that can help you on your journey of personal growth and empowerment. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We look forward to exploring more ideas and insights with you in the next episode of Rethink.